Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the country and across the world. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this very special edition of MetalCon Online. That's right. MetalCon has changed their webinar format to a brand new name. MetalCon Live is now MetalCon Online. Nothing else is changing, simply the name. This session being presented today in partnership with the Metal Construction Association or the MCA is the introduction to ANSI MCA FTS-1 test method for wind load resistance of flashing used with metal roofing systems. It might be a mouthful, but it's incredibly important. Our speaker today, of course, is the incredible Bob Zabzik, and Bob is the president at ZTech Consulting and the fantastic member of the MCA. He's going to share all his information on this session. For more information on the MCA, you can always check out their website at metalconstruction.com or metalconstruction.org. I apologize for that. Then we have another MetalCon Live coming up in two weeks. That is Employment in the Metal Industries, Maximizing Your Experience. This session is being presented in partnership with the Future Leaders. Future Leaders is a group of individuals from both the MCA and MetalCon designed to help bring the future leaders of the industry together and just make this industry that much stronger as we proceed into the future. That session is taking place on March 6th, and we welcome any and everyone to join us then. As you all know, MetalCon is coming up on October 30th in Atlanta, Georgia at the Georgia World Congress Center. Mark your calendars, and as a very special note, our room block is now available. So if you want to get a head start and book those hotel rooms, please feel free to do so. Again, our exclusive housing provider is Globetrotter. All the information for that is on the MetalCon website, metalcon.com. At the very end of this webinar, you will get a pop-up on your screen that allows us to get you a certificate. All you have to do is fill in a few brief questions, including your first name, last name, and your email address so we can get that certificate off to you. We also have an optional survey available as well. We welcome all your feedback there. Also, this is a course that is AIA HSW approved. So if you are looking for those credits, we will offer them here. Finally, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to submit those into the chat section on this webinar or in the Q&A section. I'll be monitoring both. Without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Bob Zabzik, the incredible MCA member who's going to teach you a little bit more about the new ANSI and MCA testing. Bob, go ahead and take it away. Uh, thank you, Kaylin. I appreciate the kind introduction, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, I live up to those expectations. So I'm going to share my screen here and get us rolling. Okay. All right. Kaylin, are you can you see my screen okay? Absolutely. We All right, so I had, I lost a little uh, I lost a little box to make sure it was doing displaying the same thing. So uh as Kaylin mentioned, um the technical director for the Metal Construction Association, uh Z Tech Consulting is my company. I'm a contractor to MCA. Uh if you are an MCA member, have attended one of our meetings, you probably have heard me talk. I appreciate you joining joining us today. We're going to talk through uh, a, a test uh, that we have developed at uh, at MCA uh, with some partners uh, regarding uh, the edge metal systems, determining the strength of edge metal systems as they relate to uh, flashing of metal roofing systems. Essentially. Um, what we're talking about is keeping the roof intact during design level events and protecting them from damage that initiates along the edge or at the ridge or hip of a of a metal roof. Um, so I'm going to do all the talking today, but by no means is what I'm presenting today all mine. Uh, we got a lot of help in this area. Um, MBMA has partnered with us uh, actually a couple of years back to develop a video that uh, I'm going to show you here towards the end of the presentation. We presented that at the Rakawi Spring Conference in 2021. Um, and uh, Rakawi is, uh, as you don't know, the Roofing Industry Committee on Weather Issues is a group of roofing 
consultants and experts in the industry uh, that goes to visit post-design event uh, sites, assess damage, and uh, publish those results and reports. And they do very important work. We actually have our spring conference coming up in uh, Phoenix, Arizona in about two weeks. I will be there. So hopefully if you're coming, I'll see you there. Uh, ATAS International uh, contributed a lot of material, both for the video and for some of the photo slides I'm going to show you today. Uh, and also Fairball Engineering and Testing that actually conducted the video test that we'll say. I, I did, their name's not on here, but uh, PRI, uh, Construction Materials as well, provided some input on the uh, particularly in the photos and those tests that, that I'll show you here in a second. So I want to be sure and recognize my partners and all the help that they've done uh, to uh, help, help us bring this along to this point. So why is this important? You know, it's an important thing to understand. So while this is not something that is uh, showing itself up uh, in a lot of areas, we have noticed in some of these recovery investigations with hurricanes and, and high wind areas that sometimes these metal flashings uh, start a failure of a roof system. And they're typically not these you know really massive failures like you see uh, on the, on the internet of, of, you know, entire roofs ripping off. This is really more like a small little portion of the roof would peel up and water egress comes in and creates damage. So that's actually the more common, uh, you know, it's not as, uh, as exciting to look at the photos of that type of damage. But if you look and see what actually happens in storm, those are, that's predominantly the, the, the damage that you have. The destruction is, uh, what everybody talks about it shows a lot of pictures of, but for every, building that was severely damaged, there's probably, you know, four or 500 that had minor damage that still needs to be repaired. So results in an insurance claim still creates problems for the industry. So we wanted to understand, although we have really good historical performance in this area, it's just like anything else in life. What can we do to get better? We know that metal performs really well in high wind events. We can see that from looking at these photos where the, you know, the field areas of the roof have done just fine. But when they do occur, we've noticed that those flashing failures may be part of the beginning or the, the initial point of some additional damage. And there's been others that have kind of noticed the same thing. So focus in on roof perimeter areas, although the ridge and the, and the uh, hip uh, of, a, uh, of, a, of a roof, uh, particularly on the steeper slope areas, might be uh, a point uh, to look at as well. And I'll just show you some photos. So these aren't metal roofs, but the reason they... Uh, one's a single membrane, the other one's uh, <clears throat> built up. But th the reason I'm showing you these pictures is that this is something the low slope roofing industry has actually already addressed. Um, and they've done so, this is another example uh, of a building where the edge metal had initiated uh, uh, some damage into the roof. And this is really more typical than what you see uh, in, in for roof damage in general. You know, not that gross uh overwhelming dis uh destruction of the roof but just areas that have failed and caused ingress so the low slope industry worked uh hard came up with this test uh, that's recently renewed in 2022 i think 1998 was the first version of it yes one and this was the uh low slope roofing industry's um uh, test to answer these types of challenges so as we're working with Rakawi and some other organizations, and we're seeing some of these things show up in the metal roofing world, like this particular building, and you know, we want to take some uh, take some action to to improve the industry and 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 make these buildings perform a little bit better. Um, so when we start looking through some of these photos, we started seeing some pretty consistent themes. This was probably started out as an anchorage failure. Um, a lot of times when you have edge metal systems that tie into a wall that's not uh, a metal wall, um, sometimes the, the, the design of the connectors between the walls and the edge metal falls between the cracks, so to speak. The contractor grabs what they think works. And it might be fine, but maybe it's not the right spacing, you know, whatever. And then you have an issue like this. A um, little different scenario, I think, here is probably more like a, uh, a, a failure that initiated at the eave line and peeled up. But you can still see that the as it did, it released, uh, released the roof trim. 
probably a little earlier in your designer would have anticipated that to happen. Here's probably a better example, although it's a little bit farther away, but you can see of a metal roof. This is what they call a, a metal roof over a closely fitted deck uh, with some underlayment on it and initiates at the gable end of the building and progresses towards the metal. And that's the type of failure we're, we're trying to address. So uh, we worked with uh, ANSI and, and SPRY. Actually, we used the SPRY canvassing method. And we took started with ES1 as a starting point, but obviously metal roofs and low slope roofs are built very differently. There's different scopes. So we really uh, uh, developed this beyond, um, beyond what some of the basic things on ES1 were into some areas specific to metal roof. And I'll show you what those look like. But what's the interesting things is that uh, with uh, FEMA having just recently published a report on Hurricane Ian damage, and this is just uh, made, I was made aware of this just a few days ago. Um, I've issued a report. Uh, I've talked to a couple of gentlemen who were on the mitigation assessment team on this uh, uh, investigation about four or five months ago. And um, this is some of the pictures that they showed, and they were actually interested in, in the test method that we had developed at MCA and wanted to talk about it. And so we did, and, and uh, when their report came out about uh, four or five months later, they recognized, you know, that in this report, hip and edge roof coverings for many residential buildings appear to have inadequate resistance to wind loads, and that was not something unique to metal roofs. There were a lot of asphalt shingle roofs, and and if you look at the report, some tile roofs as well had similar problems. So this is definitely something that we felt like needed to be looked at on a global scale. And one of the recommendations actually they've made in response to that conclusion was to consider adding the MC, uh, MTS, or FTS1 test to the IBC uh, code cycle change. And so actually MCA, uh, put in a code change proposal for that in the previous version. It, it did not get through the process, but um, we will revisit this again when cycle B starts up uh, next year. So we'll talk a little bit just about what the standard is and what it does. It's actually pretty simple. You'll see when, when the video rolls here in a little bit that um, <clears throat> there's not a whole lot of elaborate technology used to generate the loads. It's pretty straightforward. And we wanted to keep it that way because we're trying to make sure that anybody who's running ES1 could run this test. You know, have the same kind of equipment. So uh, it we, we went through canvassing pro the process is sponsored by SBRI. So they're really our partner in this as well. And uh, the final version was approved in June 2019. It's been designated uh, MCA, MCA FTS1 2019. We're up to... Uh, uh, a five-year renewal period now. We're in the process of gathering up a consensus committee to restart that, uh, redo that canvassing process for renewal. And there'll probably be some changes we'll discuss as well. And uh, so more to come on that. Uh, the standard itself, as I've explained, just talks just about metal roofs and flashings of metal roofs. It does not limit to low slope. It's for any slope. Um, and it provides a methodology only, so it's not a design guide. Uh, this is this the goal of this is to give uh, a, a an engineer, architect, specifier a data point, and and the data point to relate to what the wind uh, likelihood of wind failures along the edge might be, so that they can you know enhance a design. Um, We'll talk about in a little bit after the video about actually how that might work in a design scenario. Um, so there's four key sections in the and plus there's commentary as well. We we'll talk about the test apparatus, the specimen, how it's built, the loading procedure, and of course, like any other uh, test test method that's ANSI approved, it has to have a report section stating specifically what's in the report. Uh, trying to keep those things to a certain format so that one report looks and reads very much like the next. So this is the edge, or excuse me, the ridge or hip test of this, uh, or configuration of this test. So you can see, we'll, like I said, very simple. We've got some type of decking or substrate. Usually this is a, gonna be a plywood or, or, or um, you know, maybe slatted deck, could be metal as well, but uh, a lot of the, uh, the buildings that we've looked at and we've referenced to this point were residential. 
So we're, let's just talk about this in terms of a wood deck, but it could be any kind of deck material or it could be open framing. Actually, there's nothing about this test that requires deck, uh, but there are some ways that you can address this in open framing scenario and aren't always available to a deck designer. So we're really focusing in on deck in this presentation here, but essentially you're loading this, this piece of trim that goes over the top. The, both of these roof panels come in, they meet at the ridge or the hip. And um, that would be a you know weak area where wind could get in without this trim. Of course, the purpose of the trim is is really more to shed water, but the but it still performs a, an important function to keeping the roof panels on. Very similar on a, a edge along a rake or gable. Um, basically, two faces of these types of trims is obviously a schematic but there are both vertical and horizontal loads applied simultaneously. The vertical load is twice the horizontal load, just kind of keeping with what you'd see in uh, wind design practice. And everything that is in this assembly uh, has to be tested uh, that holds the panel to the decking. So actually I got, when we'll get into the, the test and some of the other details you'll see, uh, what's actually getting tested, but we're trying to keep this schematic pretty simple in the in the in the uh, standard so that it can be compared to other other methods. Uh, very similar in the ridge scenario. Usually, what happens in a ridge, you got a little bit of an overhang here for the roof panel, a place that wind can kind of pick, and so the securement of the panel uh, as well as the trim here uh, is important to that whole system and staying in place. Those loads are again are applied um, directly to the trim, or excuse me, to the flashing system. And this system right here, we use a lot of these, particularly in roofs over deck, which these are called cleats. The purpose of a cleat is to provide uh, some ability of the of the uh, trim to uh, react to, to thermal differences. So the roof is not always going to be the same temperature as the walls. Uh, and so that thermal expansion contraction difference has to be resolved somehow, and that's done primarily through the cleat. Uh, this is really more like what you'd see in the real world scenario. So I'm going to go back and forth. You can kind of see the difference between a cleated and a directly fastened application. And uh, so we're really, like I said, again, there's nothing about the standard that says it's specifically to address cleats, but this is the this is the type you'll see from the photos. This is the 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 point of failure we're trying to address that cleat becoming unseamed from that starter piece. The Can flashing test. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry, we have our first question, and it's directly okay. related to what you were just mentioning. Um, what would you estimate the cost of this test to be, and performed on a special roof condition mockup? Oh, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a good question. We, I can tell you that we spent about 3000 bucks doing the video, uh, but that included some extra, uh, uh, extra costs that involved that wouldn't be part of the test. So, um, you know, I would say somewhere in the $3,000 range. Perfect. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Uh, so yeah, we got to keep the specimen Full size, obviously, this is a one-to-one -one relationship between what's being tested and 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 the results that we're trying to establish. Um, usually, these uh, systems come in a stock length and they're cut to the field to match. So we're matching the most common stock length, which would be ten foot minimum. Sometimes you'll see twenty feet for larger buildings, but uh, we stuck to ten on the test. Uh, direct loading of the flashing. So what does that mean exactly? Well, there's different faces. Obviously these things can be quite faceted. So uh, we had to put some specificity to that. So any face greater than two inches, which is cleated, any face greater than four inches in general. And uh, there would be three tests required, <clears throat> minimum tests required, three required for flashings, one or two faces, and six required for flashings that require three faces. So uh, essentially each, load plane results in three tests. So that failure determination, pretty simple whenever the specimen can't take load anymore. And that's usually going to be one of these failure rate modes. There's fastener failure uh, that could be pull out through the substrate. That could be the metal flashing system pulling over and it 
Usually we're talking about screws, but it could be a pop rivet. That could be any kind of power actuated fastener, anything that's used in that, then that, that we're trying to be faster non-specific. And of course, breakage of the trim section itself, flashing unlatches from a cleat or clip. And uh, that, that is uh, what we just talked, discussed about earlier, that the cleats perform an important function in terms of thermal resistance, their, their ability of the system to react to thermal changes. Um, but we want to make sure that's not a weak point. Flashing component itself, rupture, tear, cracking, that's um, pretty rare that that's the failure mode, although it's possible what happens a lot of times it initiates when, when you start seeing that at rupture being a, a, a factor, it initiates actually at a connection point. Now, pullout is a one thing I wanted to mention in the metal roofing industry. Uh, we'll, when we look at fasteners for pullout, uh, we're testing kind of a lot of different things. We've got a, a, a metal substrate system, or excuse me, a metal flashing system that we're testing. Uh, and it could go into a variety of different substrates, plywood, metal deck, you know, uh, uh, masonry. So. Uh, it's it really is difficult to know sometimes all the different types of systems you could be going over. So sometimes when we test things, we'll actually uh, test uh, the system, but then we'll do what we can to eliminate pullout as the failure mode. Uh, and that's done actually for a very specific reason when we go into metal, uh, because there's a way in American Iron and Steel Institute standard S100 to design for that. So we can actually combine this with design practices for pullout. And that means that we can separate those. We can get pullout data for the fastener in different substrates. We can calculate it as needed for steel. And then we can then address that as a separate design condition for a given trim system. So just wanted to, to make that point. That's a little uh, pretty common in the industry uh, that uh, that way you'd avoid having to test for all those different substrates when you know what the answer is going to be because somebody's tested that fastener and that material already or has a design procedure. So there's a specific loading procedure you'll see uh, loads applied in a two to one ratio. Uh, as I mentioned, vertical in, in the case of a, a one that's uh, a roof and a wall, two to one vertical for roof to wall flashings. And then there's a loading phase. You hold that uh, load for a minute, then you unload it and you let it rest for a minute. And that's during the period where you record your results. And then you do that again over and over at higher and higher load levels until you see failure. Uh, the first cycle is usually a third of the anticipated ultimate loads. You kind of have to have a feeling for what this anticipated load is going to be. Then you increase it in one six increments until the failure, and then each load's held for a minute. Uh, and then you also have to maintain a certain rate of loading. So this is to to eliminate dynamic effects. Uh, you keep your load rating. If loads are less than 100 psf, you have to achieve that load in a minute or less. And loads greater than 120, greater than 150 psf, you achieve it in two minutes or less. So it's uh, slow enough to preclude dynamic effects, but uh, quick enough so that the fasteners and the um, uh, sealants and things like that, you'll see sealants actually hold things together, not by design, but they just do because they're sticky. So you got to make sure everything comes to equilibrium, and that's a big. Re that's why you. Only that's why you have to get a certain level of load and you have to hold it at that point. And then you wait until five minutes before you start the next cycle. So I just give you an example. If I have a flashing, it's anticipated to have an ultimate load of 120 PSF. It must be loaded to minimum four times at 40 PSF. So that's a third of 120, 60 PSF, then from 1.6 on out, and then uh, until you get to the ultimate load of 100 PSF. So that test would continue in 20 PSF uh, increments, the 16th anticipated load, until the specimen fails or the capacity of TEPRAS is reached, or the party conducting the test decides to end it. Um, that could be just simply because we got to where we needed to go. We don't need to to finish this out. Um, so you'll do this test, not just to establish the strength of a given system, but maybe you're going to evaluate improvements to a system for to develop new details. In fact, that's what has uh, provided that efforts, what ATAS went through and has what, what provided us with the uh, slides and the pictures I'm going to show you in a few seconds. Actually, that's right now. So here's their standard detail that ATAS had 
had uh, has always had um, and continues to use today, but they also wanted to test this this particular enhancement to the detail. So what this is is an extra piece of metal. I think I have a zoom in here, and no, I don't. I have a zoom in on a couple of slides so you can see closer. This extra piece of metal, and the idea is just to provide some additional restraint deflection limitation at that point. Uh, and one of the things you want to do as an engineer, you know, deflection is both a good and a bad thing. Uh, you have to have deflection to absorb load. It's a physical requirement, but you want your deflection to be manageable and consistent as possible because if it gets inconsistent higher in some areas in there, that's when you start to see disengagement. And some of these photos you can see, um, we won't see a visual difference, but what you will see is you'll see an increase in load capacity. I think generally speaking, they got about a 20% increase in load capacity for this change. Uh, this is what it looked like before. This is what it looked like after. Um, it's really difficult to see because of the lighting, but there is actually this little deflection limiter piece of metal right here in that little cap that Z closure off to make a little triangular truss mechanism essentially to limit the deflection. And uh, even though you might say, well, those look the same, I'm gonna show you a picture of the cleat that's on the other side of this. So in the initial test, because that deflection was happening at a more localized level, it actually caused a rupture of a popper of it right there. And you can see that that's what initiated the failure. But afterwards, um, the popper of it's held and eventually you got to a higher load and you started seeing that system distortion and that's what ultimately caused that, that test to stop, but now at a higher load rate. So it achieves the desired result. And you, uh, you can then implement these, uh, these changes in the areas where um, you're subjected to the higher loads and, and we'll talk about that towards the end, about what that means, how that would be implemented. Here's a similar type of test along the rake. And uh, really, this I think is where I have to zoom in. You can see this is essentially just an extra piece then to, to reinforce this backup Z closure that's in there. And um, again, these tests look the same before and after, but the desired load result was actually quite different. And um, again, what we uh, what we managed to achieve is uh, getting the deflection to be more consistent down the profile and therefore engaging the entire system in the resistance as opposed to just one component near the edge. Uh, and this is a similar situation for an eave detail. Uh, the, the change here, as you can see, is they went to a two-piece cleat here and then secured the lower cleat, and then they upgraded all of these materials. So they went to heavier gauges for those as the tested detail. Uh, and so this is previously uh, what they got was excess deflection near those cleats. So after addressing those uh, changes, they got much more consistent, less deflection along the cleated areas and then got to a higher level of load before it disengaged. Um, so pretty much worked exactly as you'd hoped. Um, covered most of this uh, briefly before, but the test result, of course, has to include the name of the testing organization, the date of the test, the observer's names and qualifications. This is all standard ANSI stuff. Uh, description of the specimen, where it was manufactured, who manufactured it, cross-sectional drawings to support the assembly, as well as what could then be transmitted to uh, a set of details to actually get that improvement uh, implemented. And of course, thickness and yield strength of the specimen materials is uh, important, obviously, for to make sure that you understand where uh, all the materials that you're, you're, you're using in this test get repeated in future implementations of it. Maximum load that you achieved, the tabulation of the test results and load durations. And of course, this needs to describe the mode of failure. Photographs are always a good thing. And um, so now let's talk a little bit into this virtual test. And before I start this video, check the time. I think we'll have time to hit a couple of questions real quick. Um, so Lisa's asking if the will be included in the code similar to the flat roofing requirement. Also, will there be a code compliance system, a code compliance system, sorry, near the, the flat roof uh, ANSI SBR certification through NRCA? Um, so the first answer to that question is it'll be slope neutral. Well, of course, 
I can't tell you what the code requirement is going to be because I'm, you know, that's uh, determined not by me. But uh, yes, that would be the idea. We'll include that, and we're going to make it uh, uh, slope neutral. Um, and then imp what gets implemented in the code is, in fact, what the code body decides they need. And so a code compliance system similar to ANSI certification. So basically, is a listing required? That's not necessarily in the works, but that is something that could be added um, if, uh, if the market deems it's necessary. Uh, let's see if we had other questions. I think that's the, that's the two that I see here. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm going to move on to our virtual test. This test is uh, focused at this detail that was here along a, a rake or a gable ledge um, for one of their more popular roof systems. This is the apparatus is tested. So this is essentially the same detail I showed you earlier, except you have uh, showing the lugs that are used to apply the load and um, actually what all got assembled uh, to, to into that test. So um, w this is an important part of the documentation that, uh, that goes into the report as well, because again, you know, you're testing, you're trying to match what gets used in the field as closely as possible, but there are modifications you ultimately have to make in order to facilitate the test. So you try to keep those at a minimum. And that, of course, is the purpose of publishing those details so that anybody give that transparency to the user to understand that what had to get changed in order to physically fit it into the test apparatus uh, and how that related to a detail that gets feel, used in the field. Um, so here's the load application that gets put on, again, vertical load here at twice at what the horizontal load is, is but they're being applied simultaneously, uh, supporting structure, and here's a cleat pretty much is uh, how this works. It gets started a little slowly. I think there's about 30 seconds of blank space here, but you'll see that start. And uh, it's about a five minute video. I will probably speed up the middle part, but we're gonna start at the beginning. You can just see, we're gonna go through a couple of load cycles and uh, I'll do my best Tony Romo imitation here and common as necessary. As you can see, this is a spreader bar uh, with some uh, uh, assemblies that are create, uh, done to make sure that everything gets loaded evenly. So there's a completion of the first cycle. And of course, uh, as you'll, you'll notice, you'll see some load increases. You'll see more and more deflection as time moves on. And I think what I'll do is I'll let this get through about three or four cycles. We'll advance to the failure. This is a time lapse, obviously. All right. So I'm going to move us up about a minute in sequence here. Oops. I believe this is the failure cycle. So as you can probably guess, there's some cleat disengagement on the backside that initiated that failure. I believe we're going to see a, a follow-up of a couple of different angles. Yeah, here you go. This is where that cleat actually engaged. This is previously a vertical. There's a perfect shot. This is previously a vertical uh, assembly. You see it got pulled off. I don't think this is completely unloaded. I think they left a little load on there for purposes of photos. 
Um, so uh, there is some permanent set, but not as much as you see. Oh, this is a uh, short, yeah, here it goes, a little uh, slow motion of the failure cycle. See clip disengaging on the far side. And just unzipping. I guess it's even slower. progression riveting stuff i know and you can see that uh see that failure that unzipping start at the far edge and just come along as it goes so even though that pulley system and the cables ensure that the load is distributed evenly the failure is initiates on one side and propagates to the other it's not uncommon in structural testing in general so there you go Mm -hmm. There's two questions that are coming in. Um, where can they find the products listed for this standard? And then the other one is also, how is this different from the ANSI SPRIFM 4435-ES1? Yeah. So first off, the the test, the, the listed pro there are no listed products. There is not a listing requirement for this test. It is, it is just, uh, it's not uh, incorporated into a standard other than the test standard. So uh, you would just ask your manufacturer if they have uh, evidence for the test uh, having been conducted on their system, and they would tell you if uh, what the, that is, it result is. Um, this is one of those things that um, you build it. You're 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 building some momentum. You're trying to get to a critical mass as the test gets implemented. And uh, as time goes on, uh, you gather more data, and you then migrate this into a standard or a code. Uh, then the second part of that question, so it, e, ES1 is, because it's for membrane systems, you actually, you, you assemble the, the, edge piece, the edge metal piece like you normally would, except you don't trim the, the portion of the membrane that comes out of the bottom side of it. You actually, that's your loading surface. So it's a totally different scenario you're trying to model. So in a, in a or you try, excuse me, you're trying to recreate in a, in a membrane roof, what happens is you get the billowing. Um, and so differential pressures develop, the thing kind of balloons up. And because of all that distortion, your loading directions and prying actions and things like that become undeterminable. You can't really know what they are, at least not from a calculation standpoint. So um, that's why the test exists. Uh, and so to do that, instead of billowing that 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 uh, that membrane up, you're actually pulling on that tag in that comes out through underneath it. So that's a totally different loading mechanism, right? We're actually loading the piece here, and that doesn't mean this test is better than the other one, or vice versa. It's just that the industry experts that developed these tests determined that those for those types of systems, those were the most uh, realistic ways to load them. So hopefully that answers that question. So. That's great. We got a virtual test. That failure we know occurred at 200 at the cycle. That was 210, and the failure mechanism, as we saw in the uh, in the video, was cleat disengagement. So the last fully completed cycle was a 200 pounds of lineal foot of the top load, which, like I mentioned earlier, is a horizontal load of half that amount, so 100 pounds of lineal foot. Um, so that's a that's a load per unit length. Obviously, you, that's not what you're getting out of the code. I have to be able to convert that to a PSF, right? So this is where the engineering judgment part of it comes in. Um, so just to make the math easy, I took half the panel width here, which was a eight. It's a sixteen. It was a sixteen inch panel, and and uh, take a half the width. So let's just say, but whatever that width is, doesn't it's it's you just use it, right? So um, so in this particular case, if it's two hundred PSF. 
uh, excuse me, 200 pounds of lineal foot, half a tribute, half a panel tributary would be 300 PSF of roof load. All right. So that sounds like a lot, right? Now, oh, 300 PSF, I, that's nowhere near what the code requires. Yeah, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, um, because now we got to close the loop. How does this apply to a, an actual design with that? We got a test result. So this is going to be repeat information for the engineers and the audience, but hopefully uh, there's enough of you here that, who uh, can uh, bear, with, uh, bear with me while I discover uh, talk about some really basic things. But the goal of the structural engineer is to ensure that the strength of the system, and we use the word capacity for that, uh, exceeds the effect of the loads, and we'll call that the demand, uh, by a margin, not just that they're equal or that you know one's greater than the other, but we want to exceed that we need to provide a capacity that exceeds the, the demand by a margin sufficient to cover uncertainties in the design scenario. And by uncertainties, uh, I mean that in a very broad sense of the term, um, uncertainties in the materials, uncertainties in the assembly methods, uncertainty in the actual probability of the loads, uncertainties in the codes and how correct they might be. I mean, it, we are, as engineers, we're, we're we're really focused on certain things, but at the end of the day, we don't have crystal balls. And so we have to account for uh, these scenarios where we maybe feel like we know the answer generally, but there's a lot of uncertainty involved. So how do you do that? Well, there's two ways and uh, two predominant ways. Uh, and then when you say ways, they're philosophies that you bring. Uh, and this is actually one of the largest debates in engineering right now um, because Traditionally, it's been done with allowable stress design, but in the last 25 years or so, there's uh, load resistance factor design is becoming the more prominent way to design. And this is all handled in the design standards for these materials. But when it comes to a test scenario, um, there's actually really very little guidance about what does that mean? What, you know, what is allowable stress? How do I apply a test result in allowable stress design scenario versus load resistance factor design? It, and this is where, um, you know, we have a lot of work as an, as an engineering group to put together. But the reason why those connections don't always exist is the purpose of a test is to, to find an answer for something that we can't calculate, at least readily or predictably. And that's a bunch of stuff that, and all those things, they look different. So it, it, you really have to go to a case-by-case -case basis. But what are these differences between these two fundamental philosophies, right? So the allowable stress design requires a capacity to be divided by a factor of safety that is by design greater than one. And then you compare that result to what they call unfactored loads, which you'll hear the term service loads. Okay, so divided by a factor of safety greater than one, it's usually much greater than one, two to four, five, you know, but a really predictable failure modes, it might be 1.7, you know, kind of in that, in that range. So it's a big, it's a broad range, but you know, pretty substantial margin. Uh, and then LRFD or load resistance factor design requires a capacity to be multiplied by a reduction factor. You hear that called a fee factor, which by design is less than one. And then the result compared to factored loads, which you'll hear the term called ultimate loads. And when I say factor, did those loads are multiplied by factors that are all greater than one. I'm not talking about combining different loads. You'll see a load factor of 0.75 applied to wind when it's combined with snow or vice versa. Those are low combination factors, that's a different scenario. I'm talking about the factor that goes on to the actual load group. So um, it would be 1.7, 1.6, something in that nature. Uh, and so why do you do that? Well, aside from just having to something to argue about, here, here's what really matters, at least in terms of this of this this test method. So ASD lumps all your uncertainty in a single number. That's the short answer to all this. I've got a margin of a factor of safety that's supposed to have all of those uncertainties built into it. Whereas LRFD considers the load resistance factors, load resistances, uncertainties, excuse me, they come separately. I've got a different set of factors that I'm applying to the loads and a different set of factors that I'm applying to the failure states, to all the option, all the possible failure states that represent the uncertainties for those particular failure states. And then I combine to get all these equations together. And so which one's better? Well, I, I don't know that any of them are one's better than the other. They're just different. Uh, and so the, the code and the, low, the, the material standards like AI, uh, AISC 
uh, and AISI and, and uh, you know, concrete folks, they've all got this built in for their, their standards, their design standards. But when it comes to applying this concept to a test, really tricky. There's not a lot of stuff out there. Um, there's a general lack of guidance. We know that because these are intended to represent uncertainties, it probably is going to rely heavily on statistics. And so I'm going to direct you to um, a, a passage of the AISIS 100, which is a North American uh, coal form steel design, Section K 2.1. S standard uh, addresses this better than any other standard I've run across. Uh, there's others, other folks on the line who uh, uh, have other op, uh, other things they've investigated. I, you know, throw that in the chat box. I'd like to know what they are. This is the best thing that I found, and this procedure looks pretty messy, um, as you might expect. But the idea is that I'm trying to look at the individual uncertainties and the test result and combine them to an overall fee factor. All right, and so there's all these different things you have to consider. I won't go through these one at a time, explain what they are, but I will point out probably the most important ones. Uh, the first one is this target reliability index. So if you took statistics or remember from statistics, there's, a, this, uh, I think they call it a Z factor. It basically, this means uh, how many times, how many standard deviations from the mean can I go uh, away from the mean to get to the desired recurrence interval? And just looking at your, your standard normal probability curve, and I'm going from memory here, so please excuse me if I'm not quite right, but I think a three point, a reliability index of 3.5 is what AISI recommends for connections, uh, relates to about a 0.2% failure percent, a chance of failure, and a target reliability index of 2.5, uh, I think maps out to 99.4% 99, uh, 99 chance of success. So, you know, roughly, no, excuse me, 0.02% chance of failure versus 0.6% chance of failure. That's, I believe, is what it is. But that's not actually what comes out of this equation. This is what that equation is calibrated to. And it's calibrated to the standard probabilities using these factors. So, the other thing I wanted to point out to you is this coefficient of variation for the test conducted, or that's V sub P. Um, so usually what happens when you run this type of test, you're running three tests. And if you get three tests, uh, any single uh, uh, residual or difference from the mean being within 15% of that mean is generally speaking, those tests are reliably being uh, per, or, or, or reliably precise. That's the right way to say that. Uh, if I get a test result that's outside of 15% from the mean, I don't throw that test result out. I just continue to do other tests uh, until I get a behavior that is within an acceptable range of precision. Um, and so most of the time you'll see, you know, for these types of tests, something like a 10% uh, coefficient of variation, but it's the coefficient of variation, it can vary, right? Now, AISI also supplies uh, limits to some of these numbers. So um, without going into a lot of detail, I've just used the limits, uh, but each one of these requires its own separate analysis uh, uh, for uncertain, both uncertain, but for both accuracy and precision. So uh, anything that's a coefficient of variation or a V means that it's, it's intended to represent the variability of that or the impreciseness of that process. And then any one of these material factors is uh, an accuracy term, meaning it's designed to represent uh, or take care of any biases that may occur in your sampling. All that to say that if you run through these calculations and take your best guess at some of these numbers, uh, I'll get a factor of safety of 3.2. So what does that mean? Well, if I take that 300 PSF and I divide it by 3.2, I get 92.6, 93 PSF. And I'm just going to just pick the ca a case that's pretty typical, but by all means, the code or the standard that you're working with tells you here. Uh, I just picked a 7 to 20 degree roof angle, 20 foot mean roof height. Building has protected openings, means it's not partially enclosed or has in or is in danger of becoming partially enclosed during a design event. And I'm using the zone 3R coefficients, which are, and this is really hard to see, I apologize, this is the best screenshot I could get at ASCE 716, but that's these edge zones along this rake or gable face. So there's a 3F 
uh, which is near the uh, uh, ridge and the eave, and then there's this two in right here. So what I do is I go, these are my zones. I come over here to this graph and based off the log of my effective wind area, which is nominally the tributary area of a, of a, of a uh, given uh, piece or material, I pull off what these values are. So um, I'm just going to say a one, one square foot area just to make the math easy, but that gives me a uh, coefficient, ex, uh, gust coefficient of three, or, or excuse me, external pressure coefficient of 3.6. And I got an interior pressure coefficient then that can counteract or act with that. And it is uh, 0.18. So I combine those two together and then I get 150 PSF, which when I Go back to an ASD load, my 0.6 weighting factor gives me 90 PSF. So that's right where I was. Uh, 140 miles an hour, what all that comes down to. So what does 140 miles an hour get me? Well, I just for grins, I took the ASCE 716 map here and uh, dotted in where that 140 mile an hour contour is. You can see it runs offshore in a lot of these places. Um, so obviously not part of it. I just drew that in so you could follow it visually. But really what we're talking about is that uh, this may not be adequate in areas right along the Gulf Coast in Texas. Yeah, you know, it's part of a chunk of Florida. And of course, this is all based off of the latest uh, of 716, 720 is out now. There's different answers here. So you can see with each individual standard, there's changes. And that's just kind of where where we are as a, as a community of engineers right now, still standardizing some of these wind, wind procedures. Although the components and cladding uh, process that I've done here is actually pretty consistent through most versions here lately. Had been a whole lot of changes with them. So with that, I covered the material I anticipated. It looks like we've got just enough time to address some questions. I see we have some in the chat. So I, um, I will go to it. Uh, actually, it doesn't look like I have anything new coming in. So, got Lisa, I got Lisa already. So, feel free to answer any questions. Type them in. No pressure, but type quickly. Somebody sends me a thumb up, a thumbs up or something, so I know there's. Uh, I know you're out there. Ah, there we go. Thank you, David. All right. I'm not seeing anything coming through the chat right this moment. I'm going to start singing and dancing here in a second, everybody. You don't want that. Uh, somebody did ask a question if the uh, copy of the slides are available for the presentation. Uh, Caitlin will send those out. What I will do with Caitlin, excuse me, with Caitlin, uh, um, that video file makes these things huge. That video is actually available to the public because it was part of a code change proposal uh, uh, cycle, last cycle. And I'm pretty sure that URL still works. So we will replace the video that's embedded in the slides with that URL so that you can get to it and see the video. And we'll probably distribute a PDF instead of a, a um, uh, PowerPoint version of the slides, but we will take care of that. All right, well, that's it. So it looks like we've covered our time allotment here and um, not seeing any other questions, uh, I think I will go ahead and stop my share and uh, we can close this out. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Look forward to seeing you at Metalcon and um, have a great day. Great week. Be safe.